Welcome into the official. After a week off, I am back. And we have now gone through our three-star quarterbacks, our three-star running backs, and our three-star wide receivers. So go and be sure to check out those episodes of the official. They're, you know, kind of g- gaining a cult following. People love to know those sleepers that might hit. And, you know, at the end of your freshman drafts, any of those guys are probably in play. And you never know who's going to be the next Quinchon Judkins that we hit on the year prior um, or various other players. Damian Martinez is another one, had a thousand-yard season as a freshman. This episode is kind of wrapping up the entire season of recruiting. So 2023 coming to a close now. We've got signing day in the rearview mirror. We have now kind of finished up some of our sleepers, our three stars. And now we are going to give our final superlatives for the 2023 class. We've got about eight official awards to give out. We will talk about a few other players and a few other concepts of this class as a whole. So stick around. This is the official. All right, gentlemen, thank you for carrying the show last week. Uh, thank you to Felix, one of our C2C founders, who stood in for me last week. But uh, glad to be back in the saddle with you guys and coming to the end of an era. You know, this is the end of the 2023 season. We're about to be done and turn that page officially. How are you guys feel? And you put in so much work this year. Um, and I feel like we went a lot deeper than we did last year. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I you know, I at least doubled, maybe tripled the amount of players I looked at in total. I'm sure you guys probably did too. I mean, we devoted pretty much a whole year to almost exclusively recruiting, so uh, I'm pretty happy with it. David, yeah. did you share, did you yeah. share those? I think my brains, I think all of our brains are a little bit fried. Um, we went deep down the rabbit hole, learned a lot of stuff, um, toyed with our rankings quite a bit, and hopefully they come out pretty good. I think Matt and I graded around 250 players, so it's. I think we learned a lot. I think they're going to be good, um, and even hopefully even better next year. Yeah, you know, I, you know the uh, the major services, you know, they'll put out top what uh, you know two four seven has top two four seven rivals. I believe has the rivals two fifty. Um, on three has uh, I think the, the on three three hundred maybe, um, but that's all players, right? We're looking at two hundred of. Four positions, basically. You know, th- we are going way down uh, to find everyone who sticks with the official, who rocks with the official. We are going way down the rabbit hole to find you, the next super sleeper who's going to carry your CFF team and hopefully get you NFL production once the time comes for that. And when you can get that, at the end of a freshman draft or off the waiver wire, you know, from one of these former three stars or even, you know, four star, just picking them right. is so huge because the hit rate's so bad. So if we can even elevate that hit rate from 10% to 20%, you know, we've done our job. Um, <clears throat> so now that we've come to the end, you know, and we feel great about this, at what we've done with this class in terms of just scope of knowing the players, how would you compare 2023 to 2022 Uh, In terms of, like, areas of strength, what is the hallmark of the 2023 class, Matt, to you? In terms of what we look at, the fantasy-relevant, you know, type players. Um, that's a tough one. I I guess I would say the, the, just the amount of high-end quarterbacks, having three in class isn't super common. And, you know, even the services, they would consider it, you know, five with Arnold and Nico uh, as well. And then uh, we would obviously throw in Levin in there. But I think those six are pretty high-end guys that are going to be good, at least college players. They all have high NFL upsides as well. So I, I think that's really the, the hallmark piece of this class. David, anything, any different thoughts there? I mean, I'll just echo that as well. Um, I think this QB class could be pretty special. There's The top of the class is, is really good. And if these guys are like – they come close to their ceilings. I mean, there's going to be a lot of a lot of good NFL players in here. Even like this Austin Mack guy that came out of nowhere. We don't really know a ton about him, but he seems to have a uh, a pretty good ceiling as well. 
And um, as far as like running backs, I think the running back class turned out all right. It's I think the last one was deeper, um, yeah. but kind of similar towards it. I think I had Singleton higher than um, <clears throat> than the guys in this class, just you know by a little bit of a little bit. Like I definitely love Baxter, so um, and I feel like receiver is just good every year, so. Yeah, I feel like that too. Like receiver, you can always kind of find guys you like. And, you know, you we talk enough. I think we're barely on the same page. But high-end quarterbacks absolutely is, is exciting for this class, considering most of the leagues we play in, you know, on the college side are at least two starting quarterbacks, sometimes uh, two starters plus one or even two additional super flex. Uh, I'm in some CFF side that start four QBs a week. So that's huge. Uh, to have such big name quarterbacks um, with that upside. And then, yeah, uh, running back a little bit to be desired. And we talked on the three-star show, you know, at the beginning, there there were three-star guys in last year's class that I loved. And there's, eh, this year, you know, I'm sure someone will pop, but there's no one that I would be willing to absolutely draft in every draft like I did last year. I drafted almost, you know, 100% Damian Martinez because he was free at the end of drafts. There's no one like that this year that I feel that confident about, uh, you know, as we make our way down the list. So, okay. And then, uh, you know, I don't know. I think you guys have looked a little bit to the 2024. We did a look ahead episode a few months ago um, and you're somewhat starting to get familiar with 2024. What do you think, you know, if someone's looking at their draft picks now, do I sell if I'm not enamored with the pick that I may have to get a, a 2024? I mean, is there some high end, is there a high-end position in 2024 that you're already kind of excited about before we dive in, obviously, deeper over the next few months? So just off initial impressions, I think there's a, the high end of this class is a bit better than last year's at a couple mm-hmm. positions. I think Rayola is probably better than any quarterback in this class, uh, even though you know, we really like a lot wow, of these guys. Wow, that's saying something. But that's saying Ray- something. Rayola is special. And then there's two wide receivers who are – pretty remarkable in Mika Hudson and Jeremiah Smith. I think Jeremiah Smith is probably better than any wide receiver in this class. I think Hudson is the best wide receiver in the past few years based off what we've seen so far. Okay. So I, I really think the high end talent is what's really stood out so far. I'm not sure if the depth is going to be quite there yet. We'll have to see. I haven't gone that deep. We'll yet. find somebody. We'll all, and, we always no. find somebody down there. And running back doesn't look, you know, uh, it doesn't look like he has quite like a Baxter yet, but there's a lot of, I, th- I would say there's like more high end guys, but still not a ton of depth from what I've seen, mm-hmm. but, uh, still super, super early in the process. Very early. Yeah. Um, Can I love there. Micah Hudson. I love Micah Hudson. I've already looked at him quite a bit. He's exciting. Uh, there's another guy out of Texas, uh, Draylon Smith, I think who I really like a bit. They kind of remind me of each other a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it'll be exciting. Um, but the depth of really good QBs, I think, defines 2023. Um, like you said, Raiola maybe would even be QB1 in this class. He's definitely QB1 in the next class. After that, I'm not sure we have, you know, four or five really good QBs. I know Austin was talking. He's making a point in his mind to leave every draft with, like, at least one of the top four QBs and one of the top three running backs uh, as much as absolutely possible. So, you know, that's kind of the name of the game in the, uh, in this uh, 2023 class and then receiver, like David said, I mean, kind of always good and you can always find guys you really like, and it's so deep. I mean, that's the way it is all of fantasy because the way teams offenses are going now, receivers are just kind of, you can find a guy, you can always find a guy and it's harder to find QBs and running backs. Um, so who is a player, David, for you that like every time you thought about it, every time you went back to the tape, you just were like, eh, he needs to be bumped a little bit. He's just a constant riser throughout the entire process. Is there a guy like that for you this up uh, this cycle? I, I kind of cheated with this answer. I kind of lumped these guys together. I just basically it's the freak wide receiver wide receivers basically. So I'm talking about Cordell Russell. Um Malachi Coleman and Nicholas Harbour kind of bunched together there. Uh, you know, Harbour and Coleman were sort of positionally, you know, ambiguous. No one really knew what they were going to do. And, and now it sounds like they're going to receiver. And like, the more I think about it, I'm just like, these guys are just so freaky. Um, it's hard for me to imagine a coach just like, you know, sitting these guys. Like, I just feel like 
they're going to contribute and get on the field in especially year one. the depth charts they're going to right i mean both of them yeah yeah so all three of those guys ended up making my tier two uh and they weren't really before prior to the senior years they weren't really on my radar too much okay Matt, how about the opposite? A guy who every time you watched, every time you looked at your rankings, you're just like, eh, I need to drop him a little bit. A constant faller for you. Um, I think for me it would have to be Benjamin Hall. I mean, this is slightly my mm. fault just because I was so high on him going into the season when you know none of the services were. So I kind of set myself up for failure there. <laughs> but uh, you know, he just didn't have a great year, and uh, you know, just. As I came to it more and more, I had to accept uh, reality and drop him down a bit. Yeah, didn't he kind of even lose carries on his own high school team this year? Yeah, I mean, they do have, you know, in next year's 2024 class, they do have a really good guy, but he was also losing carries to someone else, you know, in this class that isn't playing FPS, so. Yeah, okay, not great, not great. Um, Fair enough, and then answer for both of you, Who's a player, probably going to be a middle round type, because, I mean, in the front end of these drafts, you just, you know, you're uh, you're at the mercy of your draft slot. But a guy, you know, maybe four, fifth, sixth round, where it gets the ADP gets a lot looser, who's a guy you'll try to leave every single draft with um, in that kind of range? Um, I don't know if he'll be – maybe fourth round. Caden Fagan, do you think that's a good enough answer? Is that, I think so. Criteria? I think – I think – I mean, you know, it depends on if, if people listen to the, you know, the official too yeah. much or if your league mates listen to the official, if your league mates are in our Discord. But I think in most C2C leagues, he'll be in the fourth round for yeah. sure. Well, yeah, then, yeah, that would be my answer. I, I really think he's going to be a CFF stud, and he has, you know, a ton of physical upside to where he'll at least be drafted, uh, you know, if he can be a successful college starter. So I, I he's definitely a, my target in most drafts. I think Fagan could be – I don't know if he'll have the first year in a production, but, yeah, I think he could be. Like, he's the closest thing probably to, like, a Damian Martinez where he's, you know, he's not going to be drafted very early. He's kind of – I guess he's a four-star, but he's an athlete, so he's going to slip through some cracks. Um, but he's got the size, he's got the speed, and he's going to an open depth chart. I mean, he does just like Damian Martinez. So, um, very interesting there. And then, David, same question for you. Uh, guy you want to leave kind of those middle rounds maybe that you're going to be like, I- I'll probably end up taking him every single time. Yeah, it's pretty hard because we've done so much talking that we're not going to get much value on the, on the guys that we like. Um, <laughs> if they, yeah, people, followers of uh, – if you rock with our website, you do get these names quite early. Yeah. I'll just say since it's fresh in my mind, I'm doing we're doing a mock right now. I, I got Michael Mitchell in the sixth round. I just – I don't, I'm not like, I'm not in love with him, but he does have a three down skill set. He is listed at 206 on 206 pounds on Utah's website. Like, I think he's just going to be like, a, he could be a solid college player um, with potential for NFL. So it seems like a, a reasonable mid round guy. Yeah, I agree with you. Actually, I may get you a name in a little bit um, because now I realize I need to answer my own question. Uh, let me just look here. I think a guy that I'll probably wind up with a lot is going to be, I mean, Avery Johnson, because I think I have him higher than most people and I'll probably wind up with him just because I think the upside is there with him. Um, and then like Joshua Manning. And I, and I say that because Joshua Manning is definitely a draftable player. Um, you know, there's some very sleepers that, you know, we'll probably just collect along the way because they'll be free. But like Joshua Manning this is fourth to sixth round. I would imagine. Um, and I just, I think he's got tremendous upside and he's going to get a little bit of a soft landing spot with burden being the, you know, the guy defenses are going to be keying on and um, you know, we'll see what that Missouri offense looks like, but uh, I think he's quite good. And uh, yeah, that's probably my guy full fade. Anybody's got a full fade. Uh, so probably a higher end guy. Cause obviously as the, as the rounds get deeper, it's kind of like, whatever but you know in the top three rounds a guy you just probably won't be taking i That's can open up for one. me yeah, i don't yeah, really I mean, have I, an answer for that yeah. for me I at think, the right value i'll take anybody but yeah i mean for me it's gonna probably be deuce robinson i don't even know if he'll be drafted now that all the baseball stuff's going on 
Um, it's well documented that I didn't love him anyway. And now it's like, what's he really going to do? Is he going to try to play two sports? And so, you know, he'll, at one time we were thinking he was like a late first rounder in, in freshman drafts. I mean, I don't think that's the case anymore, but someone will take a dive on him second, third round. I probably, you know, will abstain there. Um, and if anyone else has a name, that's fine. Otherwise we can, we can move on to our actual superlatives. I probably won't end up with a bunch of high, Hakeem Williams, even though I'm probably an idiot and I understand he has an insane <laughs> he has an insane ceiling, but I just know that people love him so much that I just I don't know maybe I'm like like risk averse now I don't know I don't know I'm too conservative but I he's... don't I don't think you're conservative I mean you just I have the same concerns as you do yeah I mean I like I generally like to swing for the fences but he's my wide receiver eleven. Um, which might be dumb. I don't know. So I, I just don't think I'm going to end up with him. <laughs> well, I think that swinging for the fences to me is a little bit of something you do in the middle to late rounds. I'm not sure I want to do that. Just like all or nothing swing could be a freaking Juco player in two years in the first round. So I think given where he's probably going to go, I I'm probably, yeah, I'm probably out as well. Um, and that's not a prolific passing offense either. So like, what are we really hoping for? We'll see. All right. Drum roll. We've got our superlatives here. We've made eight official awards after talking to each other. And so number one, a guy we've talked about a lot, and he's going to walk away with some hardware here tonight. Biggest wingspan. That's going to be Kamori and Pimpton. I got to give some award to David's guy. Um, you know, I think this shows a lot of what David – does so well finding these diamonds in the rough uh, guys who are going to rise. Cause when we looked at him originally, he was a Vandy commit three-star dude, you know, not that many people had heard of about him. And now we're sitting here, LSU commit flipped LSU got a fourth star. And uh, now, I mean, I've heard non C2C people talking about Pimpton. So congratulations, biggest catch radius, uh, Either one of you, I guess. Do you know the actual wingspan on this guy? I know it's huge. We've talked about him. Uh, there's uh, there's not an official wingspan, but um, he was measured in at 36 and a fourth uh, arm length, which mm, I don't know how much I – that was at yeah. the All-American Bowl, I think. Um, and yeah, generally – go ahead. I was going to say, so that's – that's 76 inches arm, and then you got his back, too, for full wing. So that's going to be big. He's over seven feet, I would think, or right around there. Probably like seven one, seven two. Yeah, and he plays big. I mean, his tape, you know, high points the ball, that whole thing. So congratulations. Our first award is Camorian Pimpton, biggest wingspan. Speaking of a guy with another probably very big wingspan, best hands. Goes to Jacoby Lane going to USC as a wide receiver here. Um, you know, we haven't talked about him a ton in terms of overall prospect status, but when I asked you guys best hands, you both said Jacoby Lane sounds right. So, Matt, you want to tell us a little bit about, like, why he's so special catching the ball? Yeah, I mean, he's just shown it so consistently over and over again. I One-handed catches, going up and get it. Uh, it it's really incredible that the level of consistency at which he's done it. Um, you know, I posted a few on my Twitter. It's just, they're, they're very remarkable and, uh, you don't really see it often. So it stands out quite easily. Awesome. All right. Jacoby lane, best hands. And he's also like six, isn't he like six, six or something? So, I mean, he can uh, post six, up four. six, four. Uh, so he's a guy that can high point and use those hands to catch. And then we got another USC receiver, and we're not even talking Makai Lemon yet, uh, who's a very good player. Um, but we've got best change of direction, that really special ability to just put guys on skates, you know, make him touch air. Um, and that's Zachariah Branch, who don't probably need to go into him too much. I mean, this guy, we've compared him to Jalen Waddell. We've compared him to Tyreek Hill. Uh, tremendous body control and uh, best change of direction was kind of a unanimous pick by us um, for this superlative. All right. So those were kind of the, the appetizers. Um, now we're going to get to some, I think, uh, as, you know, as we go on here a little bit more, 
fancy formal awards. Number one, at this point, we're going to go highest floor. There was a few players uh, that we talked about. I'm sure the, the audience can kind of guess who this is going to be. But yeah, none other than Arch Manning. Uh, pretty easy choice here for highest floor. I think we all kind of agree. Um, but David, like, what do you see in this guy? And, and what are you expecting? I know there's a there's been so much discussion around Arch Manning, the recruitment, the uniqueness of his recruitment, all this stuff. But now he's going to be at Texas. And like, what are you expecting? In his, you know, three years there, presumably three years at Texas. Yeah, he seems to be very polarizing. Uh, you know, there's like two camps. Uh, you know, the one one camp thinks he's really talented. The other camp is just think he's getting boosted up by his last name. But I think that he's got one of the best brains in this class. I mean, I I charted, I think, five or six of his games. It must have been 150 or so dropbacks. He had zero turnover-worthy passes. I mean, uh, I think you charted even some of his junior stuff. and um he draws guys off sides i mean he knows he knows where to go with the ball he's getting beyond his second and third reads more than anyone else in this class like he's just an advanced he's calling his own play he's calling audibles he's doing all that stuff so he's he's very advanced um and talent wise i think he's pretty toolsy too i mean like his arm looks it looked to be improved as a senior looked real strong. He seemed to be more aggressive in general. Um, so I think he's going to be, and I think he's going to work his way into a first round NFL draft pick eventually. I think he'll start for two years and be real successful at Texas. Yeah. I mean, I think that's all very fair. I agree. I like, I don't see a world where he's like bad, you know, and I think you can't say that about many of these prospects because we kind of just don't know. Um, but I think like at worst, he's going to be like, He'll take him to a bowl game, you know, nine and three, 10 and two, maybe more, but like, that's kind of his floor. I mean, that's really good. Uh, and like you said, probable first round draft pick, um, unless he just is awful, which again, I just don't see that. So um, not, there's some things that are not like, he's just not elite, elite, elite at every possible thing, but um that doesn't, I mean, that doesn't always matter. Like he's just good. So um, all right. Highest floor, a little bit of an unsexy award, but but important, especially, and I preach this a lot, like when we do what we are doing with these highly volatile prospects, to have a guy that you feel real safe about, it, you know, that means something because so many of these guys are going to bust, you know, maybe not even start ever in college. Like that happens, like even five-star guys, and they just like never even get on the field, which is crazy, but it happens. Um. These are the last, the last four here are very fun. So we've got biggest arm. Everyone loves to know who throws the hardest. If you haven't been following along, JJ Cole out of Iowa, I believe going to Iowa state has the strongest arm in the class. And you can tell when you watch this film, he absolutely can rifle it. Matt, tell us a little bit what 12.6 VOE means for anyone who may be catching this for the first time. Yes, that's velocity over expected. It's just our in-house way of measuring uh, players' arm strength. And that means over expected means basically um, given the throws that you chart and the throws that he's making, it's velocity of individual throws more than you would expect. So it's not just the pure miles per hour. It's actually taking into account the types of throws that are being made, right? Yeah, the the distance. There's a high correlation between how far pass is and the velocity of the ball. So we just adjust the velocity by distance. Okay. So, yeah, 12.6 BOE, which is actually very, very high. Uh, you've actually charted some, some pro and college players, and he's like fifth in our entire database right now. Isn't that right? Like behind only like Mahomes and Josh yeah, Allen or I mean, something? It's, it's still a limited uh, sample, so. Limited sample, but he has a gun. There's no doubt about it. Um, I think that doesn't mean he's going to be a great quarterback, but, you know, it's interesting and it's a nice tool to have if you can develop other things for sure. Um, all right, moving on to probably the least name brand guy here is a G5 player who is the fastest in the entire class. Everyone wants to know who's the fastest. That's going to be Tanel Bryant who you guys charted at a max miles per hour of 22.7. David, how fast is that? Are we talking like already NFL caliber breakaway speed? 
Yeah, especially for the guy his size. He's a pretty small guy. I think he's only like 160, 160 pounds. Um, so if you're trying to like correlate that to 40s, which is a difficult task, I feel like maybe Matt has a better grasp on that, but he should comfortably run in the four threes. I don't know if that's good enough to get him in the four twos, but um, yeah, he's he's pretty he's pretty fast, and that's there are some bigger names up there too, like Cordell Russell and Cameron Selden, who are you know 22.5, 22.4 as well. Yes, yeah, twenty two point seven. But there was a few. I mean, what I uh, there's like what five guys over twenty two. I mean, if you're breaking twenty two, you are elite. Um, and there was like maybe five in the class, but Bryant just happened to be the most that you guys captured. All right, last two, and these are kind of the maybe the most fun. We've got highest upside. That's what we all love. We all are chasing upside all the time, right? So. We've got a guy, and he's going to South Carolina, which is really interesting. But it is Nicholas Harbor, highest upside. Matt, tell us why. What do you see? Let's just play. I know that, you, you know, we joke. You don't do the irrational comp. But just for a moment, let your mind wander. He hits his 99th percentile ceiling. What kind of player are we looking at with Nicholas Harbor? Well, yeah, the, the the comp there would have to be Calvin Johnson. I mean, uh, 6'5", 230, running incredibly fast track times, you know, 10 to 100 meters, which I believe Calvin Johnson actually has a recorded uh, 100 meter of, of around there, either a 10 2 or a 10 3. So it's pretty – and Harvard's doing it in high school. I'm not sure what level Calvin's was at. So uh, the athletic ability is there for them to be, you know, very similar. Um we just have a lot of questions with uh, Harbor as with his actual wide receiver uh, abilities. Yeah. I mean, of course he's the classic boom bust raw. Can he develop? But yeah, the athleticism as we've talked about all year, we just actually, you know, on the official, I feel like we have not talked about him that much because we assumed for so long he was going to be an edge, uh, but his recruitment was really interesting. And I think it was because, I mean, I think he could have gone to Alabama UGA as an end or as an edge, but went somewhere who said he could play offense. And we will see now he's kind of a, well, yeah, where would you guys draft this guy? And he's such an unknown. I mean, I just hadn't thought about it. Like I really hadn't thought about him that much this whole cycle. Like where would you draft him, David? Um, like third round, is he going to go before that in a, in a freshman draft? Um, yeah, I think third round sounds about right, right? I think I have him as wide receiver 14. I don't know exactly where that would place him. Um, but I'm, I'm guessing uh, kind of like Hakeem Williams, I think people will get pretty hyped up for this guy too, so he'll probably go even earlier. Now that's kind of formalized, he's going to play offense. Yeah, I think that's probable. Okay, and then finally, the player most likely to be a CFF starter in year one – so we are saying you draft him as a freshman. You will be plugging him into your lineup at some point this season. We said Texas running back Cedric Baxter. Uh, pretty much, well, you know, he's not even my running back one, but I would 100% agree with this award for him, despite he's, he's my running back two. But uh, the depth chart, the offense, I like this pick. Um, he's going to be a top three pick in freshman drafts uh we've talked about a lot we like cedric baxter 220 over 21 miles an hour i think um matt and david anything to add i mean i know you guys liked him is there anybody else you considered for this spot yeah i, I threw uh ruben owens and caden fagan out there i think they both have a pretty good chance of you know maybe ending up as the starters at their schools and getting into your lineups but i i ultimately agree that Baxter as well has a pretty good chance. You know, it's not a loaded depth chart per se. You know, we did like Jaden Blue last year, uh, but you know he didn't really uh, show us enough promise where we are going to bet against Baxter here. Yeah, and you know his big thing was showing up light and then basically not playing at all. The bad combination for Jaden Blue. David, any other thoughts? Is there anyone else you throw out there between Owens and Fagan that you think you know should have at least been nominated for this award? Um, it's tough with these freshmen. A lot of these guys don't uh, usually do too much. I guess, uh, you know, I like Justice Haynes, 
So maybe, probably not though. Um, and pretty much you can make an argument for any of our tier one wide receivers, honestly, because they're all talented and they're all super polished. Uh, it's just, you know, like Jonte Cook goes to a decent situation. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know. Death charts. Branch kind of... even. I mean, Branch or Lemon, somebody for that USC offense. I don't think – I'm not too impressed with the depth behind Jordan Addison who's going to the NFL. So, uh, yeah, I agree with that. Um, all right, very good, guys. Uh, thanks. This has been a good season, a good 2023 class. We're enjoying it. Now it's time to actually go draft these guys. I mean, we haven't even had a CFF draft. So that wraps up the official. I hope you've all enjoyed it uh, for this year. I mean, we're going to have a bit of a transition here. Then we give these boys a couple of weeks off to kind of rest their brain, um, start peeking into the 2024 class. So when they come back, we will start officially looking into the 2024 class. But we're going to have about, I don't know, depending on how many uh, shows I can set up, we're going to have about four to five to six kind of interviews with some different people, kind of some like non, basically get away from like the direct player talk and maybe talk a little bit more philosophy around recruiting. Uh, we've got a couple interesting guests lined up already uh, from Breakaway Data, talking about how they measure some of these players and some of those athletic testing that we bake into our rankings. So kind of a little uh, hodgepodge, but you know, it is going to be a transition period and then we will get these guys back and do 2024 sometime, you know, in April or May, but stick with us. We're still going to have shows for you. And uh, David and Matt, as always, it was a pleasure. 2023 class kind of in the books, kind of in the books now. All right, everybody. It has been, you got to find it, the official.